the war seems to drag on forever. What's your scenario for an outcome or a solution for that war? How is it going to continue? Well, I think it's going to be a long war. Um, and I think that the Russians will ultimately prevail. Hello, I have with me today John Mearsheimer, one of the preeminent political science theorists, theorists of international relations. And um, I'll be discussing a number of issues with John Mearsheimer. It's a pleasure and an honor. Welcome to Germany. Glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me to be here. It's a great, great honor. And uh, you're a structural realist. As, uh, and uh, when I was in school, in, in grad school, when I studied for my PhD, realism was uh, one of the theoretical directions and, and uh, theories we discussed about international relations. I identify with that theory too, but could you explain briefly what it is? Well, realists believe that the most important element in international politics is power. How powerful a state is really matters. Because in the international system, where there's no higher authority that can protect you, you want to be as powerful as possible. Because if you're weak, other states take advantage of you. So the balance of power matters greatly. And realists believe that whether a state is a democracy or an autocracy or a fascist state or a communist state, it doesn't matter. All states, because they operate in this system where there's no higher authority, have no choice but to compete for power and to strive to be the most powerful state in the system. And I think in essence, this is what realism is all about. And of course, I would note here that uh, in the West, uh, especially in the United States uh, and in Western Europe, uh, there is an intense dislike of realism because realism says that democracies behave no differently than authoritarian states. And in the West, in the liberal West, people want to believe that democracies behave in a noble fashion and autocracies do not. There are good guys and bad guys in the eyes of the vast majority of people in the West. And the democracies, of course, are the good guys. Realists say there are no good guys and bad guys. All states are pretty much the same and they have no choice but to act in similar ways because of the structure of the international system. And again, when I talk about structure, what I'm talking about mainly is the fact that there's no higher authority that sits above states. So Putin, Biden, Trump, doesn't really matter. I mean, it's the structure of the system. So it's or how much do they come into the equation? Absolutely. And if you listen to much of the rhetoric in the West, uh, especially from President Biden, uh, the uh, conflict between Russia and the West is framed in terms of democracies versus an authoritarian state. And of course, this authoritarian state, Russia, is the bad guy and we in the West are the good guys. Of course, yeah. But a realist would say that there are no good guys and bad guys here. And really what happened uh, uh, to cause the Ukrainian war was in large part a function of realist considerations. For example, a realist would argue that it was foolish for NATO to march up to Russia's borders because the Russians would view that as a threat. Uh, which, of course, they did because the Russians were thinking in very realist terms. But many people in the West believed, foolishly, I would add, that we are the good guys and the Russians would understand that NATO was not a threat and that it was a noble uh, mission on our part to bring Ukraine and other East European states into NATO. Of course, the Russians didn't see it that way. They saw it more in terms of realpolitik. To German, to many Germans, this, I mean, I, I was surprised to say that in the U.S. This is, they, it's viewed the same. I thought the, there were more realists in the U.S. than in Germany because to Germany, is, this is uh, quite uh, 
let's say, an uncommon thought uh, because what you say about the liberal West, that is basically what sank in. But you also uh, criticized or you, you had um, an argument that the unipolar moment where liberalism basically went rampant or uh, what went wrong after 1990 was, was liberalism. Yeah, my argument is that realism is a theory that applies to great powers. It's all about great power politics. So during the Cold War, when you had a bipolar world and the United States and the Soviet Union were competing with each other, this fit very neatly in the realist story. What happened was the Soviet Union went away and we moved into a unipolar moment, right? This was unipolarity. And it ran from roughly 1990 to 2017. And during the unipolar moment, by definition, there was only one great power, which was the United States. So you didn't have great power competition. There was no rival great power that the United States had to compete against. So for the first time in its history, the United States was free to take a holiday from realism and to pursue a liberal foreign policy, which I would call liberal hegemony. And the end result is that the United States behaved in a way that was at odds with basic realpolitik during this unipolar moment. Now what's happened is that starting in about 2017, we moved out of a unipolar world right. and into a multipolar world. So now what we have are three great powers in the system, China, Russia, and the United States. And in effect, Great power competition is back on the table. Realism is alive and well. And I would add that probably over the course of the next few decades, you will see the appearance of more realists in Germany than has been the case during the unipolar moment. I like to say that during the unipolar moment, Germany was a realist free zone. There were hardly any realists right, in right. Germany. And I would like to see that, <laughs> so I, I hope it, it, your prediction turns out to be right. But let's go back to the unipolar moment for a second. What could the U.S. have done differently? Well, what the United States should have done is it should have not helped China to grow economically. This was a remarkably foolish policy. China is now a peer competitor of the United States, and the United States played a key role and turning China into a peer competitor by fueling its economy. And this strategy, of course, was based on liberal theories of international politics, which I think are wrong-headed. So with regard to China, we should have had a fundamentally different approach. And with regard to Russia and NATO expansion, we should not have pursued NATO expansion at all. But if we did pursue NATO expansion, we should have stopped after the 2004 expansion. Uh, when we decided in 2008, when NATO decided in 2008 that Ukraine and Georgia would become part of NATO, that was a huge mistake. And the present war in Ukraine is largely a result of that decision. So I would argue with regard to Ukraine and Russia on one hand, and with regard to China, on the other hand, we should have pursued a very different policy and we'd be much better off today as a result. And you said that uh, even in 2015, I mean, you have a famous public lecture at the University of Chicago online in the internet. I just looked it up, it has 29 mil million views now. It's, it's entitled, Why Ukraine is the West's Fault. And I mean, that's a quite provocative title, but uh, apparently people like to see it and uh, I've seen lots of positive and agreeable comments below it. So that's basically, you, you've been making this argument for a while. Yeah, well, it was in April 2008 when NATO decided that Georgia and Ukraine would be brought into the alliance. And the Ukraine crisis first broke out on February 22nd, 2014. That's when the crisis broke out. And I wrote a piece in Foreign Affairs that attracted a great deal of attention at the time, which said that the crisis in Ukraine, or war in Ukraine, if you wanted to call it that at the time, was largely the West's fault. Mm 
And of course, people in the West didn't want to hear that because people in the West want to make the argument that this is all Putin's fault and it's not the West's fault. But my argument is that it was the West's fault because they pursued NATO expansion for the larger purpose of making Ukraine a Western bulwark on Russia's border. Russia said this was unacceptable. But anyway, I wrote that article in 2014, and then I was asked to give a talk to the University of Chicago alumni in 2015, a year later. And I chose that as a topic, and I gave this talk. To be honest, Max, I don't, know, I don't even remember giving the talk. I have no <laughs> recollection of giving the talk. That's amazing for something but, that yes, had with such an impact. It's had such an impact. 29 million views. But it's maybe astonishing. Because it just came natural to you and you just were expressing your natural thoughts. This is so clear to you that you didn't have to think about it a lot because it's just so clear before your eyes that you forgot all about it, and then it <laughs> went stratospheric. Yeah, well, I think once the, the war broke out in 2022, the present war broke out, uh, I think people then were deeply interested in finding out what caused it. And I offered an alternative view to the mainstream. And I was one of the few people who offered that alternative view. So I think in that context, it's unsurprising that lots of people viewed this 2015 video uh, and, and produced 29 million views. I come back to the uh, paucity of alternative views or the uh, little number of voices that voice those alternative views in a second. So uh, it's clear what we could have done differently in, in the case of NATO expansion. I'm not so sure or clear about what we could have done differently about China because in some ways, I mean, China's rise probably would have been delayed but not stopped. Or uh, do you have a different view on that? I don't think it would have been stopped. I think there was no question they were going to rise. Uh, I think it would have been slowed down greatly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think they'd be anywhere near as powerful today as they are. Uh, and I think the United States would have been able to maintain a substantial gap in economic might and military might between itself and between China. Um, and you mentioned that uh, the American elites or some part of the elites profited from the rise of China, so there was some collaboration there, and they, so they were all for, um, or many, of, of many influential figures were for the rise of China. Oh yeah, it's really quite remarkable uh, how many people thought Uh, that uh, fueling the rise of China uh, would lead to a more peaceful world. I mean, the idea was that as China grew economically uh, and became more prosperous, and as China was integrated into more and more international institutions, like the World Trade Organization, which it joined in 2001, it would become a responsible stakeholder in the international system because after all, it was benefiting greatly from uh, being a part of this American-led uh, international liberal order. And then, very importantly, as it grew prosperous and as it became a responsible stakeholder, China would become a liberal democracy. And of course, once it became a liberal democracy, it would be a peaceful state vis-a-vis -vis all of these Western countries, and especially the United States, because democratic peace theory says if you have two liberal democracies, they won't fight each other. So ultimately, we would make this prosperous China a liberal democracy, and we would all live happily ever after. Now, a realist like me says, this is crazy, right? <laughs> If China becomes powerful, it's going to want to dominate Asia. It's going to want to challenge the United States. That's just the way international politics works, at least from a realist perspective. And I think if you look at the historical record, there's lots of reasons to believe that realism is a powerful theory. But people like me couldn't make that argument and get hardly anyone to accept it. And uh, what you saw was that the elites who uh, really uh, were close to 
the American elites who were close to the Chinese elites worked hand in hand to help China grow and make the argument that China would be a responsible stakeholder uh, and a partner with the United States in producing uh, a liberal, peaceful order. I want to question your use of the word responsible, which is the way probably an American policymaker would use it. It's the American definition of responsible. So. Um, Clearly China has risen, clearly China is a challenge to the American order. Um, clearly, clearly they step out of line here and there, but by and large, I mean by expanding peacefully through the Belt and Road Initiative and so on, I would say they, they've acted, I mean yes, they've challenged the order because they've risen in power, but they're not that irresponsible, that would be, depending on how you define it. I think that's correct. I mean, I think the Chinese understand that they have a vested interest in changing the order somewhat, but not fundamentally undermining the order, at least for the time being. But the problem is that as China grows economically, the United States begins to get more and more fearful, right? Because all of that economic power can be translated into military power. And given that China is not a status quo power, it's very important to understand that China believes that the South China Sea belongs to them. China believes that Taiwan should be made part of mainland China. China believes it should dominate the East China Sea and that these rocks that are a point of dispute with Japan belong to China, not to Japan. So China is interested in not only growing economically, but growing militarily and using its military might to change the status quo. And once the United States starts to see China grow in a really serious way economically, it begins to get very nervous. And by about 2017, it's the Americans more than the Chinese who are intensifying the security competition. It's not so much the Chinese who are changing their behavior in concert with what you were just saying, it's more the Americans. Mm -hmm. And this is good old fashioned realist logic at play. You had a nice, came to me in that clarity just when you observed it to me in our conversations that of course, uh, Joe Biden made a huge 180 degree turn on China. I mean. Uh, the, the confrontation really was first explicitly mentioned by Trump in the Trump presidency, yes. but before that Biden was all pro-China and now... Yes. When Joe Biden was the head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and when he was Barack Obama's vice president, right, this is up to 2017, in those decades before 2017, he was an arch proponent of engaging China. He helped in very important ways. He profited, right, from promoting China's rise. When Trump comes in in 2017, China, uh, Trump fundamentally changes American policy towards China. He abandons engagement, explicitly abandons engagement, and he develops a hard-nosed containment policy toward China over his four years in the White House. Then Biden comes into the White House in January 2021. Some people expected that Biden would go back to the old policy of engagement. But in fact, what Biden does is he not only continues to pursue Trump's policy of containment, he actually makes it even tougher on the Chinese than Trump did. And what this reflects is the fact that China is now a peer competitor of the United States. It's quite clear that people in the Biden administration are scared stiff of this powerful China. But I would note that these people in the White House were part of the establishment, the foreign policy establishment, that helped turn China into a peer competitor. And when people like me argued in the early 2000s that the United States better slow down China's rise or do everything it can to slow down China's rise, we were dismissed as being remarkably foolish. People said- and Probably old fashioned, old whatever. Old fashioned, yes, yes, yes. And now you're in the forefront. <laughs> <laughs> um, back, to, back to Europe. Um, I mean, we now have this terrible war going on in Ukraine and we're not being told the truth and it's very difficult to, to figure out the truth. Uh, 
uh, um, RFK uh, uh, Junior just came out. There's probably three hundred thousand Ukrainian casualties. Uh, I mean, much higher than we've been told, and the war seems to drag on forever. What's your scenario for an outcome or a solution for that war? How is it going to continue? Well, I think it's going to be a long war, um, and I think that the Russians will ultimately prevail. And I think uh, they're not going to conquer Ukraine. Mm -hmm. It's not like they're going to uh, run their army up to the Polish and Romanian border, topple the regime, and incorporate Ukraine into a greater Russia the way many people in the West describe their ambitions. But what they're going to do is they're going to conquer a huge chunk of Ukrainian territory and they're going to turn Ukraine into a dysfunctional rump state. But and the whole West does not want that and we, we said we were going to prevent that. Absolutely. No. The West is going to prevent that uh, conquering of territory. Yeah, I would say more than that, the West is not the West is not simply dedicated to prevent that, preventing that from happening. The West is committed to defeating Russia in Ukraine, beating the Russians on the battlefield in Ukraine, weakening the Russian economy badly, and in effect, knocking the Russians out of the ranks of the great powers. Mm -hmm. But you think Russia will prevail and the West will probably have to give in? Or? Yeah, I mean, first of all, this is a war of attrition where Ukrainians are fighting Russians. The West is not involved with ground troops in the war. Mm -hmm. The West is supplying the Ukrainians, but it's not doing the fighting. Mm -hmm. So in a war of attrition, the key question is how many people are in Russia? How many people are in Ukraine. What's the relative population size of those two countries? And then also, what does the balance of artillery look like? Because artillery really matters in a war of attrition. It's, as we used to say in the US Army, artillery is the king of battle. Now, if you look at the numbers here, Russia has, at this point in time, somewhere between a four to one and a five to one advantage in population. This is a massive advantage. In terms of artillery, the Russians have, it's hard to get a firm number, somewhere between a five to one and a 10 to one advantage in artillery. And the West does not have the ability to give Ukraine enough artillery or artillery ammunition, shells as we say, to equal the Russian capability. So the Russians greatly outnumber the Ukrainians in terms of population size, and they greatly outnumber the Ukrainians in terms of how much artillery each side has. And in a war of attrition where the two armies are standing toe to toe and beating the living daylights out of each other, the side that has a larger population and has more artillery is likely to win. And in this case, that's the Russians. And as I say, I think what will happen is they will end up conquering a lot of territory in Ukraine and they will annex that territory to Russia. They've already annexed the Crimea and they have already annexed four oblasts that formerly belong to Ukraine. And I think they'll end up taking even more territory. Mm -hmm. And those regions are about, what, 80% ethnic Russian or? Or Russian speakers. Russian yeah. speakers. Yeah. Yes. I think, the, I think the, the Russians will not try to conquer uh, territory that is in the western half of Ukraine because that territory is filled with ethnic Ukrainians and they would resist mightily uh, against Russian control. So I think the Russians will focus on taking territory that is filled with Russian speakers and ethnic Russians. And, uh, and, and I, I think that at some point there will be an end to the war, but that end will not mean a meaningful peace agreement. The best you can hope for, I think, is a cold peace uh, similar to what you have in Korea along the 38th parallel.
Uh, so I think this problem is not going away. The fighting may stop in a few years or maybe even a few months. Who knows for sure? But uh, the conflict will remain, and I wouldn't be surprised if fighting broke out again in five or ten years. Mm -hmm. So the West will not escalate to push the Russians back? Or you're, I mean, that in some ways is a good message to my ears because the, the, the fighting... The West can escalate. It can escalate for two reasons. First of all, unless they put boots on the ground, they can't do anything to change the population balance between the two sides, right? The, the Ukrainians need many more soldiers, and they just don't have a large enough population to find those soldiers. And furthermore, in terms of giving weaponry to the Ukrainians, the West doesn't have the weapons or the industrial capacity to produce those weapons at this point in time. They may have that in two or three or five years, but that's too late. Uh, so there's not much the West can do uh, at this point in time to shift the balance in Ukraine's favor. Okay. Um, I would just add one quick right. point, Max. I think it's very important to understand that when the West first got into this war in early 2022, and it looked like the Ukrainians were doing very well on the mm -hmm. battlefield, right. and we had initiated the sanctions, right. I believe that people in the West felt that those sanctions would do enormous damage to the Russian economy, and that's what would allow the West plus the Ukrainians to win the war. In other words, the Ukrainians would do fine on the battlefield, but those economic sanctions would deliver a hammer blow to Russia, and that would allow us in the West to prevail. But the key here is that the sanctions didn't work as anticipated. You know, people often talk about Putin miscalculating, and I'm sure that Putin has miscalculated in certain ways. Miscalculation is part of the warp and woof of daily life in international politics. But I think the West also miscalculated in certain ways. And most importantly, I think the West miscalculated in thinking that sanctions would work to devastate Russia's economy. Of course, in those five years, China developed a lot further. I mean, it's really fast development, so there's lots of exchange there in terms of goods. Uh, uh, are you aware, probably you are, of the little video with, with Lindsey Graham and John McCain in where they address Ukrainian offices around the end of 2017 when they say the next year will be our year, it will yes. be the year of the offensive. Yes. So did this war in some ways some come five years too late or four years too late <laughs> for, their, for them, so to say? I, I don't think it really would have mattered. Really? Uh, Even yeah. at that time? Yeah, I, I think... Uh, I mean, I, I think the fact is that the Russians are not going to lose. And if the Russians were to start losing, if the West and the Ukrainians together were successful as we anticipated, uh, I believe the Russians would turn to nuclear weapons. And once the Russians turn to nuclear weapons, there are no winners. The idea that but the wouldn't that escalate into a general nuclear war? No, I think the exact opposite would happen. I, I believe that once nuclear weapons were used, the West would go to great lengths to immediately stop the war because of the threat of a general thermonuclear war. You and I don't want to be incinerated. Well, but we, we don't make the decisions, <laughs> you and I. <laughs> but I, I think the policymakers in this case would, uh, would, would go to great lengths to shut the war down. Uh, I, I think uh, I've been very critical of Biden, who I think uh, was much too aggressive towards Russia after moving into the White House. And I believe that Biden played a key role in causing the war on February 22nd uh, of... Uh, February 24th of 2022. So I'm right. highly critical of Biden, but he has been very cautious in terms of arming the Ukrainians and keeping the Ukrainians under control because he does not want, first of all, the United States or the West more generally to get involved in the war in Ukraine, in the fighting on the ground in Ukraine. But more importantly, he does not want a nuclear war. There would be no winners in a general thermonuclear war. And uh, I believe we would go to great lengths at the first sign 
that nuclear weapons were being used to shut the war down. Well, some reassuring words as they come from you, they are to be taken seriously. And uh, well, I, uh, some reassuring words, I, I must say. Um, but let's say your scenario turns out. So what does that mean for Europe? Uh, if your scenario materializes, we have- Well, this is a disaster for Europe. Uh, there's no question about that. I mean, good relations between Europe on one hand and Russia on the other hand benefited Europe uh, enormously. Uh, and they benefited Germany enormously. And uh, now you have a situation where relations between Germany on one hand and Russia on the other hand have completely broken down, both at the economic level and at the political level. And what you really have between Germany and Russia and between the West more generally in Russia are poisonous relations. Uh, the Russophobia in the West is off the charts. And what's gonna happen here is that for the long term, the Russians and the West Europeans or the Europeans are gonna be mortal enemies. And there's gonna be very little economic intercourse and there are gonna be these poisonous political relations. And the Russians are gonna to go to great lengths to try to sow dissension in the West. They're gonna exploit differences between Hungary and Poland. They're gonna exploit differences between Germany and Poland, between Germany and France. They're gonna exploit differences between the United States and Europe. And one prominent place where that will take place has to do with economic relations between Europe on one hand and China on the other hand. Now that Europe has been badly hurt economically because of the break off of trade with Russia, the Europeans have an increased incentive to trade with China. But the United States is not going to want Europe to do much trading, especially with regard to sophisticated technologies with China. So the United States will put great pressure on Europe not to trade with China. The Europeans have powerful economic incentives and political incentives to trade with China. So you'll have this real tension between the United States and Europe. And the Russians will go to great lengths to exploit that tension. So there'll be all sorts of possible places where the Russians can sow dissension in the West. And this will just fuel the Russophobia in the West. And the end result will be you'll have this conflictual relationship in Europe. At the same time, the war in Ukraine may still be going on. And that means there's an ever-present possibility the West will get dragged in. Well, these are perspectives, but uh, well worth considering. I mean, this is a, a situation very serious for Europe. Thank you for your assessments. I have one final question. We discussed uh, um, your seminars and you obviously enjoy teaching, you enjoy arguing for the truth. I mean, one sees that you are really deeply into your discipline and um, you teach graduates, you teach undergraduates um, and Actually, as a German and somebody from Plettenberg in Germany, which is the birthplace of Karl Schmidt, a uh, political thinker of the Weimar Republic, uh, still read internationally quite a bit, you mentioned that the uh, concept of political by Karl Schmidt is actually one of the most popular, if not the most popular book in some of your seminars. How is that? Yeah, I teach a basic course on realism to graduate students and undergraduates. And you know, we read Hans Morgenthau, Thomas Hobbes, Machiavelli, and then some of the contemporary uh, realists like Ken Waltz, myself, uh, and so forth and so on. And on the syllabus, I have uh, Carl Schmitt's The Concept of the Political, which is an important realist tract. Uh, and, uh, it turns out, much to my surprise, that of all the books on the syllabus, including my own book, The Tragedy <laughs> of Great Power Politics, uh, the book that attracts the most interest from the students is uh, The Concept of the Political by Schmidt. Uh, and, uh, Why is that? Why is that? Well, I think that Schmidt has a remarkably provocative set of arguments in the book that are not 
terribly well developed. Mm -hmm. And students like to focus on controversial arguments. They just find them interesting. You don't have to agree with Schmidt, but he's making a provocative argument. So the students find his arguments very interesting. The, the whole friend-enemy distinction is a very interesting concept for the students. And you want to understand here, I'm not pushing Schmidt on them. Mm -hmm. This is the students themselves who decide what they like and don't like. It's the students who focus on Schmidt's book in ways they don't with regard to almost all the other books. So they like the friend-enemy distinction. They like to think about it. But the other thing is that because the friend-enemy distinction is not terribly well-developed, it gives the students lots of running room to discuss what it really means and what its consequences are for politics and so forth and so on. Not every one of the viewers will know what the friend-enemy distinction is, so maybe uh, if I can elicit that from you for yeah. a second. Well, Schmidt's basic point is that politics is all about the friend-enemy distinction, right? That uh, if you look at any society and if you look at the international system, states have friends and they have enemies, right? And politics revolves around the friend-enemy distinction. And uh, uh, if you were to ask, you know, your average person in the United States, your average well-educated person in the United States, what politics is all about, uh, they would probably say something along the lines of politics is all about who gets what, when, and where, right? Mm -hmm. Right, distribution of resources yeah, or something yes, like that. Yes, exactly. Yes. They wouldn't say that politics is all about the friend-enemy distinction, in other words, dividing the world up into friends and enemies and then thinking about how those friends and enemies interact. But that's Schmidt's definition. And again, getting back to my original uh, point to you about Schmidt, what makes it attractive to students is they don't think of politics in terms of the friend-enemy distinction. They think of it in terms of who gets what when. So when they hear a new idea, a different yeah. way of thinking yeah. about things, and a rather darker way yes. of yeah. thinking yes. about politics. Yes. There's a real dark, yes. of course, a real dark side to Schmidt because he was a dark person, right? Uh, I mean, he joined the Nazi party uh, in the 1930s. So Schmidt is, you know, in many ways, a terrible human being, but he is a brilliant thinker and he has written this brilliant book that uh, makes a provocative argument that, again, students find attractive. And that's not to say that they become Schmidtians. It's mm -hmm. just that they engage okay. with that book in ways that they don't engage with most other books. And this was utterly surprising to me at first and, and, and to some extent still remains surprising. Final question. Uh, for Germany, um, there is a friend-enemy distinction, but should Germany also watch its friends more closely? Well. In the German case, its best friend in the world is the United States. And, or at least most Germans think that its best friend in the world is the United States. And the Germans, in my opinion, have for too long had a tendency to follow Uncle Sam and do what Uncle Sam wants Germany to do. I think it would be in Germany's national interest, and I've argued this for a long time, to have a more independent foreign policy. And uh, when it disagrees with the United States, to make that clear. And I think the best example to highlight this, uh, and it is a truly important uh, story I'm gonna tell, that in April 2008, when NATO decided that Ukraine was gonna become a member, Georgia and Ukraine were both been going to become members, Angela Merkel, who was then mm -hmm. the German Chancellor right. and was at the meeting in Bucharest, that NATO meeting in April 2008 in Bucharest, Angela Merkel was adamantly opposed to bringing Ukraine into NATO, and as was Nicolas Sarkozy. And Merkel later said that the reason she was opposed that she, is that she understood that Putin would interpret it as a declaration of war. 
in a very important way, Angela Merkel was thinking like a hard-headed realist mm -hmm. in April 2008. And she went to great lengths to prevent George W. Bush, who was then the president and who was in Bucharest and was pushing for bringing Ukraine and Georgia into NATO to prevent that. She and Sarkozy tried to prevent it and they failed. They caved to the United States. I believe that if they had not caved, that if Angela Merkel had stood her ground and said under no circumstances, am I gonna go along with bringing Ukraine into NATO, that the war would not have happened and we would be in much better shape today, much better shape. Uh, but this is just another example of the Europeans in the end doing what the Americans want. And this, I think, is more true of Germany than almost any other country in Europe. Uh, uh, maybe Britain is as bad as Germany on this count. But I don't think that uh, it makes sense for the Germans to always follow uh, American dictates. Sometimes it does. There's no question that sometimes the Americans are pursuing policies that are in Germany's interests and German leaders will sign on uh, to those policies and that's all for the good. But states don't always have the same interests and sometimes leaders like Angela Merkel are thinking more smartly than leaders like George W. Bush. And in those cases, I think it makes eminently good sense for a German leader Angela Merkel in this case, to stand her ground. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for those thoughts. Thank you, Professor Mearsheimer, for your thoughts. It's been a pleasure, it's been an honor, and I wish you all best for your, to, for your voice to be heard, to continue to be heard, because it's a, one of the few voices of sanity in a quite turbulent situation. Thank you very much. You're welcome. It was my pleasure being here, Max.